Good morning, good morning, good morning. How is everyone this morning? We have a, a table all ready for us to celebrate communion, to celebrate the Eucharist, the Lord's Supper here in a little bit, so that's pretty great. Right here in the middle, thank you. Thank you. I saw, I think it, I saw Nicole working on that. Thank you for making that happen. I love communion. This morning, um, I get to talk about that. I get to talk about food in Christian spirituality, food in Christianity. And it reminds me a little bit of communion. That's what we called it when I was a kid. It was more of a Pentecostal church, um, uh, very Bible-centered Pentecostal church. And, and I remember we always took communion at, we always had prayer time before church, and it was like down in the basement. So you'd go to, go to the basement. This was Chugiak, Alaska. This is where I was a kid in Peters Creek near Eagle River in Alaska. And uh, I remember as a kid, we would take communion. We would, you know, drink from the cup. And then we, would, we always had these little cracker things. And then it was always every kid's goal. And any kid between like kindergarten and about third, fourth grade, it was your goal to go around and gather up as much of those disposable cups as possible. And you had to really hustle to, like, you had to, to make it happen because when you made it to where you gave them to the person who was, you know, giving the, uh, the, the cup and the bread, you wanted to have the most. And so, and so you would hustle. I mean, you'd be like, do you need that? I'll, I'll, I'll put that away. I'll take that for you. I'll take, and you would just, like, hustle through the crowd as best you could. And then if you saw that you were going to lose because you could see out of your corner of your eye that some other second or third grader had like tons already. What you did is you just chose like a random kindergartner and you're like, let's, let's give it all to him. So that guy loses. <laughs> and then we would, we would all put all our cups in this one little kindergartner would be like, this is all I got. And he's like, you know, it's like this high, right? <laughs> that was a glorious communion moment for me. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, gathering to share food and drink. We've been looking at community, the topic of community um, from Acts chapter 2. And we're looking at the early church and uh, looking at what, and they didn't, they, they were, we've been reading that passage again and again and, and, and what, their, what the early church looked like. It wasn't perfect. The early church wasn't perfect. They didn't even have the Bible complete like we have it today. They had, um, they, it was still being written, right? So they, they, were, they were dedicated to the teachings of the apostles, and uh, they were reading the Jewish scriptures that they had from Judaism. And, um, and I love that we talked about uh, history this morning with the kids, because history is so important, right? Because uh, as Christians, one of the reasons history is so important is that we believe that the Holy Spirit inspired human authors to actually write the Bible, which is this miraculous thing that, go, that the Holy Spirit could inspire regular people to write the Bible. And then the history component is so important because we believe as Christians that over time, the Holy Spirit inspired the church, followers of Jesus, to go, I think that's actually a part of, that, a part of the Bible. I, I don't think that is. So the compiling of Scripture, the compiling of this library that is the Bible happened over time. And so the step of faith for us as Christians is that we go, God, it's, it feels, it's a challenge sometimes, but I believe that by your Holy Spirit, you inspired not just the writing of Scripture, but the compiling of Scripture, the, the bringing together of Scripture. And then today, as we're reading Scripture, the reason I'm going to go to the Bible again and again in the next few moments is because as Christians, we still believe that the Holy Spirit is inspiring our hearing of the word, inspiring us by and giving us grace to actually try to live this out and connect with history. And sometimes when we look at church history, uh, it's very humbling, right? Because we're in new, uh, God always has this way of reaching into every, any context, no matter where we're at, and just doing his good work. God doesn't wait for us to get it all perfect, um, to start working in our lives, right? So you see that in the Bible, you see that in church history, you see that today, right? When, when 
the whole entire planet began to do church online during COVID. Um, not the whole entire planet, but much of Christianity decided to do that. That was a new thing, right? It's like, how do we, how do we look back at church history and go, and, and how do we do things like the Lord's Supper? How do we do things like communion? We have this new technology. How do we live this out? Uh, and some churches decided, you know what? Looking at church history, we don't believe that that technology holds on to the pieces of it that we want to emphasize. And so there are people right here in Sutton Valley, some of my neighbors, when they, for them to, to celebrate the Lord's Supper, communion, Eucharist, they went to church one family at a time um, over on the way to, on the way to Bellingham uh, at their church. And, and God bless. And, and so, and it's really important for us as a, for we as a church to not, not look at that and go, oh, well, we're so beyond that. I mean, get with the times. You, I mean, there's this thing called Zoom, right? Like just pray over it and take the bread. You know, like, like we could have an attitude like that, but no, as Christians, we care about church history. We care about the, whole, the Holy Spirit's work over time. And so we go, yeah, we as a church, we've decided to be okay with people online just gathering up some bread at home today and some juice and taking communion with us. But we're not going to be snooty about it, right? We're not going to be like, we're above other Christians who don't do that. We're going to be very humble, right? It's very humbling to be a Christian. It's very humbling to go, wow, we're doing the best we can where we're at in this moment in time. And we want to serve Jesus and we, and, and, and we know we're not always getting it perfect. But we want to, and we respect people who wouldn't do it this way, but we're going to do it this way because we, that's, that's, this is how we're going to follow Jesus today as a church. Christ the King, Sudden Valley, right here in this upper left-hand corner of the United States, right? Where we're like right here in this moment, and we're just doing the best we can, trying to follow Jesus where we're at. And so uh, I love the joke of like Cheetos and Cheetos and Mountain Dew. Uh, like right there was this move like about 15 years ago there was like this like hipster church was like the thing you know and I mean it kind of always is but there was a moment in in United States like 15 20 years ago where youth pastors were like what can we do I know Cheetos and Mountain Dew that would be that would be the Lord's Supper that the kids could get with you know like and I never I always heard about that I actually never participated in that particular expression <laughs> of the Lord's Supper <laughs> but um and uh, I'm just gonna just thank you Jesus that we're all in process right and uh Food, food and Christian spirituality, food in the Bible. Um, I want to look at Jesus. I want to look at just food generally in the Bible, and then end in the next number of moments in on looking at looking at the Lord's Supper, and then we'll we'll have that together this morning. Let me pray. Jesus, we need you. We we need your power, your grace. Uh, reach into our lives. We, um, we can't make it without you. Help us, Jesus. Help, help, help me. I pray that in the middle of my words that you would highlight stuff for people's hearts, that you would highlight um, your word and uh, reach into our hearts this morning. We love you, Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Food is fun to talk about. My first point is that the entire story of Christianity can be told with a meal. I read that in a book years ago. This topic has been on my heart for decades. It's been something that I've just always really cared about. I've been around lots of expressions of Christianity, lots of different streams of Christianity that think quite differently about this. And so it's always brought up a lot of questions in my heart, a lot of dialogue with God, like, why do they do it this way? Why do we do it this way? What's, what's that all about? And um, in that dialogue, I've just always been, uh, I've, I've been, I've, I've, just, I've cared about this topic quite a lot. And I remember reading in a book, I couldn't find it, I couldn't, that this idea of that all of Christianity, the entire story could be told with a meal. That in the Garden of Eden, everything was given 
for food, for sustenance, that, that uh, the children of Israel on their way to the promised land were fed with manna from heaven, that, that uh, the prophet Isaiah points ahead and says there will be a day at the end of days where there will be a marriage banquet in heaven where, uh, where all things are made right and there will be a great celebration of people from every nation. Um, Jesus um, at the Last Supper, uh, giving us the Lord's Supper, His Supper, giving us the Eucharist, uh, the book of Revelation, R R chapter 19, Revelation chapter 22, the end of days where there's the celebration of Jesus making all things right. So it really is true that all of the whole entire story of Jesus, the only God's entire story could be told with food. Luke chapter 19, verse 5 through 7. Uh, says this and I, I, the reason I want to bring this up is because I just want us to remember um, remember who what kind of person we're dealing with when we, when we deal with Jesus Luke chapter 19 says this when Jesus reached the spot the spot was where Nicodemus had climbed up a tree I'm not Nicodemus, Zacchaeus one of those guys with the E-S at the end of his name when Jesus reached the spot he looked up and said to him Zacchaeus come down immediately I must stay at your house today. That's, I want Jesus to say that to me. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. And all the people saw this and began to mutter, he's gone to be the guest of a sinner. They're talking about Jesus. Now isn't this Jesus? This willingness to knock on the door of our heart and, and, and not wait for us to invite him. Literally inviting himself in. Hey, I'm coming over today. It's like, well, I guess so. Yeah, Jesus, you're coming over. You know, like uh, Jesus willing to kind of like initiate, willing to take that first step and are just kind of like, I think I can get the laundry out of the way and just uh, do the dishes while you're talking to me. You know, like I, that, that like Jesus, come on over. I think we can do this. And I think that, that, that posture is still true today. I think that, and so when we talk about the Lord's Supper and we talk about Eucharist, we talk about communion, it can get very, the conversation can get very heavy because of church history and people who were willing to leave churches or start, uh, uh, my, I homeschool my kids. We're, talk, we're learning in history about the first colonies of the United States, right? Well, before we were states, we were just colonies. And one of, the, one of these classic Christian moments is the Puritans come all the way to the, the new world, right? They come all the way to the Western Hemisphere to have freedom of religion. And like in no time, they're kicking this lady out because she thought they were being too legalistic and about how they approach things. And so she has to like go start Massachusetts or something. Like it's like so funny how this is so true, right? This is so true of of history, of this stuff can be heavy, but I wonder how many of the Puritans from that time were remembering this story of Jesus inviting, him, inviting himself into Zacchaeus's house. My next point is this. Jesus taught both fasting and feasting. And one of the accusations made against Jesus by detractors was that, was that he was a glutton and a drunkard. Um, Jesus came, the Bible says Jesus came to seek and save the lost. I can get with that. Jesus came to serve and not be served. Huh. That's a little, okay, I think I can get behind that. But then the other, the other phrase that comes up, and I, I, I read this in a book this week that I just loved it. They said the other, the other big statement we have from Scripture that Jesus came eating and drinking. And then if you book, look at the book of Luke, Jesus is, I've heard it said that, Jesus, that the book of Luke is an opera because someone's always bursting into song, but this is a new one. I read this this week, that if you look at the book of Luke, every single time you see Jesus, he's either going to a meal, coming from a meal, at a meal, like the guy's eating and drinking, and uh, people are saying, how can he be a holy person? How can this be the Messiah? He... He, he's a glutton, and he's a drunkard. 
Now, for Jesus to be, to, for people to say that about him, um, he certainly w- would have been crossing lines and crossing norms of that time. And we know that Jesus was without sin. But Jesus had a way of shaking up the religious people, had a way of reaching into people's lives, having a way, had a way with people. And I think we have to keep that in mind as we approach things like the Lord's Supper. What kind of Jesus are we dealing with? Matthew 11, verse 18 and 19 says, For John, this is Jesus speaking, For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they said, He has a demon. Like, he's just too intense. John the Baptist, way too intense. And he never drinks alcohol. Okay? Uh, But the Son of Man, talking about himself, he came eating and drinking, and they say, Here's a glutton and a drunkard. It's funny, this is literally Jesus saying what they say about him a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. Um, Jesus says, let's look at the fruit of this. And I think that's something for us to think about. Um, There are a number of moments in Scripture where wisdom says, here's a situation. Let's look at the fruit of this. Let's look at where this goes. Let's look, at, let's look at what becomes of this. So what do we know? What became of John the Baptist? What became of Jesus? Good stuff. And so we can look at his life and evaluate through the, the eyes of, okay, well, this is where we know it landed. This is the goodness that it landed in. My next point is this. Jesus is relational. Jesus loves when we ask questions. Jesus often said things and did things that demanded a follow-up conversation. That's just the way Jesus was. He would, he would speak in parables just so people had to talk to him more. He could have just laid it out, like, here's the three things, get with the program. But he didn't do it that way. He would say something, wait, say something. You know, in a lot of the sermons, uh, it's likely that he, it wasn't like he, he gave the one sermon on the mount and he talked about the Beatitudes the one time and then he was like, well, done with that. Let's get on to new sermons. It's, it's pretty likely that he preached the Beatitudes lots of times, right? It's pretty likely that Jesus, and I think sometimes that has to do with why we have different um, verses of Jesus speaking sometimes in the different gospels where, where they're really close, but they're not quite the same. And you got to go, well, I wonder how many times Jesus preached that one. Like, I bet he preached it a lot of times. But listen to uh, what Jesus says here. And, and just to bring us up to speed on how contentious or how out of the box Jesus was and how, why the Lord's Supper to this day, why communion to this day might be a challenge for us. Because look at how it began. Jesus said to them, very truly I tell you, we're in John chapter 6, verse 53, And then I'm going to skip all the way to 60, and then I'm going to do 60 through 68. Um, If anybody wants to read all of John 6 later, all you. Jesus said to them, Very truly, I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Okay? He goes on to say more about that. And on hearing it, many of his disciples said, this is a hard teaching. Who can accept it? And if you look at John chapter 6, Jesus starts preaching this heavy message of of, uh, eat my body, drink my blood. And And he doesn't say, well, wait a second, it's just symbolic. You know, like, I'm just being metaphorical. I like, I'm, I'm just, Jesus just lets it sit. And, you know, and I think that's kind of the way Jesus was. Like, he wasn't going to over-explain. He was going to, like, he wanted the dialogue. He wanted, he wanted the conversation. And later, Jesus says, from this time, well, it says, it goes on in John chapter 6. He says, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Whoa. So it was heavy enough that people were like, were saying, I, I, this is too much for me. I, I was on board with Jesus. He started saying that stuff. That was too much. And, but then Jesus asked the 12, and Simon Peter answered him. Oh, wait, I, I skipped a part. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. And Jesus said this, you do not want to leave too, do you? 
And Jesus asked the 12, and I think Jesus is kind of slow pitching it into Peter because he's like, Peter's the kind of guy he needs to outward pro- he needs outwardly to outwardly process. Let's get him, let's get him to say something out loud, and then he, his heart can catch up, right? And so he like slow pitches it into Simon Peter, says, Are you gonna leave too? And Simon Peter says, uh, Lord, to whom shall we go? Like, where are we gonna go? You have the words of eternal life. You have the words of eternal life, Jesus. And I I want that to be my heart this morning. I want that to be our hearts this morning. I think um, when we look at the mystery, when when we use Christianity over the centuries has used words like sacrament to talk about the cup and the bread. And that means mystery. Um, Protestants and evangelicals in the last number of hundred years have called it an ordinance. But I love the word mystery because mystery reminds us that when heaven reaches into earth, there's going to be a faith component. The spiritual world, and when, when you talk about the physical world and the spiritual world, like coming together, this moment where heaven reaches earth, there's going to be a point where you're not able to explain it very well. And it's, there's going to be a mystery component. And in that mystery component, thank God there's mystery because that's where the faith component is. Now, as someone who teaches God's word, someone who teaches the Bible, I don't want to just be like, well, the worse I do at explaining the Bible, the more faith they have to have, so I just shouldn't even try very hard because we need more faith. I don't know if that made any sense, but uh, <laughs> no, no, but uh, uh, the faith component where that is, is it's like we're going to do the best we can to explain this, to explain what Jesus said, to, to talk about the dialogue through the Holy Spirit with Jesus over the centuries and do the best we can, and then there's still going to be a faith component. And in Christianity, you see different streams of Christianity where there will be a really smart person who has a lot of clarity, who really knows how to use words and philosophy to explain things really well. And then a whole stream of Christianity will go, well, that person is so smart. Pretty much if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for me. So in Roman Catholicism, Thomas Aquinas was this amazing 10th century, 11th century, um, amazing philosopher, theologian, and pretty much Roman Catholicism says, we're never gonna do better than Thomas Aquinas. The guy knew Greek philosophy better than anybody. And when he describes what happens at the Eucharist, who's gonna argue with Thomas Aquinas? Let's just leave it at that. And so, at, uh, and so when I think about what history has Rome, what's happened in Roman Catholicism, I don't wanna just be like, well, I'm smarter than Thomas Aquinas, I don't think I am, okay? Or in the, in, the, in the more Reformed tradition, well, if it's good enough for John Calvin, it's good enough for me. Or, if it, or in the more Lutheran tradition, if it's good enough for Lu, Martin Luther, if it's good enough for John, John and Charles Wesley in the Wesleyan holiness tradition, if it's good enough for so-and-so, these days we have favorite authors that have this beautiful middle-of-the-road stance. just like, well, if it's good enough for Timothy Keller, it's good enough for me, all right? Well, yes, we want to stand on the shoulders of these amazing thinkers. And, but at the same time, we want to go, you know what? We're going to do the best we can with where we're at. And we're not, and when we look at all these amazing thinkers who have done such, who have tried so hard to describe what happens in the Lord's Supper, if anything, it just should just make us humble. Just really humble. Not like, well, modern evangelicalism in North America. I mean, just look at how much money we have. That's proof that we know what we're talking about when it comes to Christianity. It's like, no, that's actually not very biblical. Um, but we just, but it should just keep us humble. It should just keep us, and when you look at this mystery of heaven reaching into earth, uh, a Catholic author that I read said this beautifully. said, you know who is the original sacrament. You know who is the original mystery. You know who, because sacrament just means by the way by which our salvation gets worked out in us. Jesus is the original sacrament. Jesus is heaven reaching into earth. Jesus, 
It's the spiritual world reaching into the physical world. It's all of us going, oh, I, I see it. And it got misunderstood. Church history talks about how in the first century Palestine, uh, people saw Christians and they're like, yeah, they're a bunch of cannibals and atheists. Atheists because they only believed in one God, right? They're, you're supposed to have polytheism. Everything's supposed to be God, right? Bunch of atheists, they only have one God. And then a bunch of cannibals are always talking about eating, eating, eating the body and blood of Jesus. Okay, so that was, that was something that happened in church history. We got misunderstood again and again. Next point is a celebration meal with generous Jesus eventually leads to more than enough. We see this at the wedding in Cana and when he feeds the 5,000. Way more blessing than we could possibly deal with. We know those stories of Jesus turning water into wine. Um, we know the, st- the and, and you, you find out about this and you go, okay, yeah, so we use Welch's grape juice and we've decided to do that. But that doesn't, and Jesus for some reason turns water into probably what, what uh, Bible historians would say is probably a thousand bottles of wine. Why would Jesus do that? It doesn't make sense. Like, that's excessive. What do they need a thousand bottles of wine for, right? Um, we don't know. But we're doing the best we can. We're using juice for a, our context, for our reasons, in our time, and we go, we think it's wise for us at this moment in time at Christ the King Sudden Valley, we're going to use juice. We, we respect that through the centuries, wine has been used way more than juice, okay? But it isn't, but we don't think we're all like better than all of church history because we use Welch's grape juice, right? No, we just, we, we just, with humility in our heart, we go, we've decided to land here. We're going to do it this way. The Bible talks about unleavened bread. Well, we have this beautiful avenue bread probably over there, you know, just cut nice in half. Or, or it looks like we have, um, you can do the cracker approach. Or if you also you're just, uh, if you want to do like the prepackaged, everything in a package, you can grab one of those this morning. Beautiful. That's where we've landed. With, with humility in our, in our heart, with gentleness in our heart, with the fruit of the Spirit in our heart. The Eucharist meal is past, present, and future. The Eucharist remembers Jesus of the past, experiences Jesus in the present, and anticipates Jesus of the future. In Matthew chapter 26, that's one of the places in the Gospels where um, we see at the, at, the Lord's, at, the, um, at the Last Supper, Jesus um, saying this, Jesus took bread and then when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. And then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. Talking about Revelation chapter 19. So it's interesting. Jesus says, I want you guys to keep drinking the wine. Me personally, I'm not going to be drinking any until the marriage of the lamb at the very end. So some Christians go, well, if it's good enough for Jesus, I'm not going to drink any wine between now and the, it's like, well, wait a second. Why did Jesus ask us to? Like, like, uh, um, everything about Holy Communion or the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist is meant to be filled with the fruit of the Spirit. And as best we can in the context we're in, How can we have more humility, more forgiveness, place more attention on Jesus? Um, One of these days when you're, it's very normal in Christianity for us to say things like, I wish we could be more like the early church. I wish we were more, um, because back then they really had it figured out. Um, I mean, we don't preach those exact words, but it's easy to come across that way. Like, if we could just get back to Acts chapter 2, if we could get— Now, it's true, there's so many parts of— so many strengths of the early church, right? But if you read 1 Corinthians, Paul has to kind of, like, lay down the law because every single possible thing that you can imagine is going wrong at the church of Corinth. And if you look at— and so— and when you, before Google, it was pretty normal for your average evangelical youth pastor like me 
to like be like, we're gonna, we're gonna do communion tonight. Um, we're gonna have worship. And last minute, I decided we're gonna do communion. Do we have any bread? Is there some juice in the back of the church refrigerator? Uh, where is that passage? And before Google, you'd be trying to find it. It's in the Gospels, right? Like it's at the Last Supper. Like why, why? And I remember, seriously, it was in my late 20s when I finally realized the passage for the Eucharist, the passage for the Lord's Supper is in 1 Corinthians 11. You can look through those Gospels for hours and you're never gonna find it. And so, uh, so, so Paul in his letter, the church in Corinth, the same book that has 1 Corinthians 13, you know, the big love chapter that's used in all the weddings. Right before that, 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 10, Paul is going, all this stuff is going on. All this stuff is messed up. Idol worship, immorality, people showing off, people bringing all kinds of food, like rich food, to the church, and then only like sharing it with other rich people. And if any poor people come, they're just like, you're on your own. You know, all these people not showing respect. And Paul going, let's find ways to show honor. Let's find ways to show the fruit of the Spirit. If we gotta, if we gotta put on head coverings, if we gotta, if there's anything we gotta do, like if we're um, in 1 Corinthians 10, 31 through 33, it says this. So whether you eat, Paul gets to the end of this whole section where he's like, do whatever you can. To make to show the fruit of the Spirit. He says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I, as I try to please everyone in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. Paul had this outward focus where he goes, Whatever we do, I don't want to stumble people. I don't want to, I'm not going to completely adjust everything for others, but I'm going to do whatever I can within my power to make this approachable for others. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make this gospel message, not water it down, but I'm going to, I'm going to live this out in such a way to where, to where the stuff I say and how I live, that it goes together. I'm going to, I'm going to look out for the poor. I'm going to, I'm going to take care of others. And in 1 Corinthians 11, before Paul reminds us of the actual words of the Lord's Supper. It says this. He says something kind of harsh. He says, he says, you guys are doing so much unhealthy stuff, you'd, and, and this is not good. <laughs> this is not good for our gathering, uh, our gathering um, topic for this, ser- these, this group of sermons. But Paul literally says this in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. He says, in the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. He's like, you should just not even meet. Like, just, just, just time out. Like, just stop. Which is beyond anything I would ever say. Like, I, I, I always feel like, you know, like, even on our worst day, like, at least we got together. Surely God can do some good with it, you know, like. Um, but Paul literally felt that they had crossed some, some sort of line where it was just like, just time out. Like, just, just stop meeting for a little bit. Let's, like, rethink this through. And then he explains um, the Lord's Supper. Let's, let's skip to verse 27 and 28. He says, So then whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. And everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. This is my last point. But it's very normal in Christianity to talk about being worthy of receiving communion. And on the surface, it's like, yeah, well, I got to get my act together so that I can go to communion, you know, like that makes sense, right? But you think about this. What is the death and resurrection of Jesus all about? The only reason Jesus even died is because you're not worthy. What, like, what is the Eucharist about? The Eucharist is about embracing Jesus who you've got to have because there's no way you're ever going to be worthy, okay? So becoming worthy and over through church history, there's been a lot of like 
um, you know, they'd have a token system. If you were Presbyterian in some parts of the world, you'd get this like little voucher that says that you confessed your sin. You can go once a month to do your, there's all different kind of ways that Christianity has tried to figure out a way to like make sure people are worthy. But I, and with humility in my heart, I respect the wisdom of all these Christ followers through the centuries. They knew, and they're in context different than mine, and I don't even begin to understand all the decisions they made as churches. But right here, right now, I really believe that the only way that we can become worthy is by going, help me, God. I'm not worthy. I want to follow you, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. And uh, I, I had the privilege of going to an Anglican seminary and in the Episcopal Church. And they do such a good job with written prayers and the Book of Common Prayer. And looks at each of the components of what would make a good Eucharistic service and goes, well, this is the best possible prayer of repentance that exists in the English language in our opinion. So we're going to put it right here in the prayer book. And I thank God for the prayer book. I thank God for Thomas Cranmer and people who wrote in the English language some of the most amazing, prayerful, written moments that even as an as a English literature person, a person should read, right? But right here, right now, know what I think the most important prayer on the planet is for we as Christ followers is this. Help. Help. Help, God. I need the mystery of whatever it is that happens where heaven reaches earth and um, however this works I know you are the bread of life I know you are the living water I know you your blood was shed for me however I can enter into that as best I can I want you Jesus I want the changing thing of you Jesus in me right now and so if the band could come up and, um, and uh, just as they're coming up, if everyone just, when you get a moment, um, don't um, eat the bread or drink the juice yet. If you accidentally do, it's no big deal. Like you, you can even go grab some more if you accidentally do. Or, um, but I encourage you just anyone who wants to follow Jesus, that is the giant hurdle. That is like, you can participate in communion if your heart says, I want to follow Jesus. That's the hurdle. And then we're just going to take a moment and say, help me, oh, help us, oh God, make us worthy. And we're going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and take communion together. And so just as this first worship song is going, you have two, right? Thank you, Price. As this first worship song is going, we'll gather up the stuff the elements, the bread and the cup, and then I will lead you all through. And if you, again, if you accidentally take it too quickly or, or whatever, it's okay. All right, so let's, let's worship Jesus. And then everyone, there are different options of how you get the cup and how you get the bread here. And so just grab the one that works.
whose love endures through generation. I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on the God of Moses. The one who opened up the ocean I need you now to do the same thing for me Oh God, my God, I need you Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages, I'm standing on your faithfulness. On your faithfulness. I'm calling on the God of Mary Whose favor rests upon the lowly I know with you all things are possible I'm calling on the God of David shepherd boy courageous I may not face Goliath but I've got my own giants oh God my God I need you oh God my God I need you now how I need you now oh rock oh I'm standing on your faithfulness, on your faithfulness. Oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. How I need you now. Oh rock, oh rock of ages. I'm on your faithfulness You heard your children then You hear your children you are the same God. You are the same God. You answered prayers back then, and you will answer now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You were providing then. You are providing now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You moved in power then. God moved in power now. You are the same God. You are the same God. You are a healer then. You are a Oh God, my God, I need 
Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and said this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me so if you have some bread I encourage you to take it right now In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat the bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Two of the most important prayers are help me God and thank you God. And so right now we just thank you God. Thank you Jesus. Thank you Jesus, gift of our Heavenly Father. We experience you Jesus by your Holy Spirit right now. We thank you Jesus for your real presence in us by your Spirit. However that happens, however that works, only in you Jesus you know how that works. But Jesus, we receive your Holy Spirit. We receive your life, your sustenance. Jesus, we need you. Help us. Thank you, Jesus. We worship you this morning. <laughs> 